Hello, everybody, and welcome to another wonderful day of chemistry. So today we're going to be specifically looking at heat, uh, namely how heat moves in and out of a system and can be used to determine enthalpy and, and internal energy. Now, one of the big things I want to make note of here is we're not looking at chemical reactions so far. The only thing we're going to be looking at is how changes in temperature reflect the amount of heat moved. And one of the ways that we can do this is by looking at how the energy moves as heat in and out of a system. Now, we can track this, again, by temperature change. So the relationship used is the heat being transferred is equal to uh, what's called the heat capacity times the change in temperature. And this heat capacity is kind of what it says on the tin. It's the amount of energy, specifically as heat, required to increase the temperature by one degree C or one degrees Kelvin. And so in this case, if I'm looking at a, if I'm monitoring a, um, a beaker full of water, what I'm doing is essentially trying to figure out how much temperature, uh, how much heat needs to be added in order to cause it, the temperature to go up or down by one degree C. So for the whole container. And as a result, the heat capacity typically has units of joules per Kelvin. It is worth noting that this is synonymous as joules per cel degree Celsius, because since I'm looking at changes in temperature, changes in temperature are going to be the exact same for Celsius or Kelvin as the spacing in between these units are, again, identical. And the other thing that is highly, um, highly important is going to be the conditions of the object being heated. Because as we've seen previously, um, the relationship in between heat and enthalpy and internal energy is entirely dependent upon the conditions. So the first thing we're going to be looking at is the fact that heat capacity, as we phrased it, is just going to be the amount of energy required to heat, say, and to raise the temperature of an entire beaker of water. However, that is less useful than you'd think, because what we care about isn't so much that beaker of water, it's of water in general. So what we often do is look at the amount of energy it takes to require a known amount of substance, one degree. So this form, uh, this type of heat capacity typically has two major forms. The first is called specific heat capacity. And this is going to be in a mass basis. So it's going to be the heat capacity per gram of material. And as a result, typically has units of joules or kilojoules per gram per degree Kelvin or degree Celsius. So for example, if I'm looking at water at 25 degrees C, water has a specific heat capacity of 4.18 joules per gram per Kelvin. So in order to increase the temperature of one gram of water, uh, one degree Celsius, I'm gonna need 4.18 joules. It is worth noting that while it is not an SI unit, a very commonly used unit is the calorie, which is the amount of energy it takes to increase uh, one <laughs> to increase the temperature of one gram of water, one degree Celsius. Yep, one uh, calorie is the same as four point one eight joules, and again, it's all based on this heat capacity of water. However, one of the things worth noting is that sometimes, especially engineers and sometimes physicists, like rephrasing this as kilojoules per kilogram. So this is the same as multiplying and then dividing by uh, multiplying and then dividing by a thousand. So uh, the ratio of units end up uh, being the same. So again, you need to put in one kilojoule or one kilocalorie to heat one kilogram or one liter of water, one degree Celsius. And this is kind of a good base to think about the um, units of energy we've been throwing around. Four joules is kind of a good reference point. However, it is worth noting that sometimes we don't care about the grams of material. What we care about is the moles of material. So we often have uh, often make use of what's called the molar heat capacity. This is denoted by a lowercase m as a subscript on the heat capacity. So just like molar volume, if I throw in a molar property, it simply means I'm taking that property and dividing by the number of moles. 
So what we can do is use this to convert from a specific heat capacity to a molar heat capacity of water. And you can go ahead and double check that this is true, but it turns out the molar heat capacity for water is about 75 joules per mole Kelvin. Because again, one mole of water is the same as about 18 grams. So not too surprisingly, it'll take more energy to heat a one mole than it would to heat one gram. <clears throat> However, one of the big things that this allows us to do is to try and actually figure out the amount of heat going into or out of the system simply by knowing the temperature change. So if I have the specific heat capacity and I know the mass of water and the change in temperature, I know how much heat entered the system. If I know the molar heat capacity, I need to know the moles of the substance being heated, as well as its uh, change in temperature to figure out the amount of heat entering the system. However, one of the things that we should watch out for is the fact that, as I mentioned previously, turns out that heat isn't just heat. Heat is a path function. And to make these units much more reliable, we have to put some extra constraints. So we're either going to use isobaric or isochoric conditions, so constant pressure or constant volume. So one of the uh, simplest cases I can do is by uh, constraining the system to constant volume. This is often done in what's called a bomb calorimeter. It's called a bomb because your pressures can jump up suddenly very quickly because you're constraining the uh, volume of this of the substance. So if any extra uh, substance is created, the pressure should jump straight up and it can turn into a bomb if you're not careful. So if I'm using these constant volume conditions, I know that the constant volume heat or isochoric heat is the same as the internal energy. Now what this lets me do is set an equivalence in between internal energy and the change in temperature. So if you have a change in temperature and you know the what's called isochoric heat capacity, denoted by the subscript V, uh, as well as the mass, you should be able to figure out the changes in internal energy. And again, just like there's a specific isochoric heat capacity, there's also a molar uh, isochoric heat capacity. So again, denoted by CV versus CVN or CVM. Yes, M does always mean moles, and this can lead to some confusion when working with heat capacities. If you're in question of whether you're working with a specific or molar heat capacity or just a heat capacity, always check the units. See if there is, if there's joules per, uh, uh, joules per Kelvin, joules per mole Kelvin, or joules per gram Kelvin. That will tell you which one of the forms people are using because the notation can occasionally get a little sloppy. However, again, this assumes that the container, uh, that the system is sealed inside a container that doesn't allow volume change. Well, this does happen. It's often under more extreme kind of physics setups or occasional odd engineering perspectives. Chemists and biologists, we tend to, well, work in systems that are open to the air. So instead of using uh, isochoric heat capacities, we much more uh, commonly are going to work under isobaric conditions. Now remember, under isobaric conditions or constant pressure, such as provided by the atmosphere, the heat transferred is equal to the enthalpy instead of the internal energy. And as a result, we generate a set of isobaric uh, uh, heat capacities, both uh, specific and molar. And one of the things I do want to make note of is that when we use CP earlier, I was kind of bearing the uh, the lead, and we were specifically talking about isobaric systems. So again, always note whether there's a P, a V, or something else as a subscript. So if I know my isobaric heat capacities and change in temperature and either mass or moles, I should be able to figure out how much heat is entering or leaving a system. And again, specifically entering or leaving a constant pressure system. Now, one of the things I do want to make note of is that if I'm working with a lot solid or a liquid, it turns out that my uh, isochor uh, isobaric and isochoric heat capacities are going to be very similar. And the reason why is if you remember, uh, enthalpy and entropy differ by PV. And 
there isn't much volume or pressure change for solids or liquid systems. However, for gases, we have to watch out a little bit uh, more because now the enthalpy and internal energy are often going to differ a lot. Because if I'm heating the system, temperature increases, which means that we'd expect either pressure or volume to increase. Or if I'm looking at them together, the whole system's either going to get very high pressure or very high volume. I don't really care which. Either way, we're going to see a big deviation in between enthalpy and internal energy. And this is the reason why we like to emphasize the difference in between these two different state functions. Now, one of the things that is worth noting is that the enthalpy is, almost, is usually higher than the internal energy if I'm heating a system because this PV term will always tend to be positive if temperature increases. And it turns out this is also the reason why covering um, a pot with a lid will, uh, will cause it to essentially start boiling faster. Because it turns out that if I'm isochoric, have a lid on, then, I, uh, <clears throat> then I'm not doing, uh, turning any of that energy into expansion. If, however, I'm working under uh, isobaric conditions, the gas is expanding out into the room and I have, to, and that takes up a little bit energy. So if you always wanna make sure your water boils faster, put a lid on it. If you've ever wondered why your uh, microwave dinner exploded that time, it's because you didn't poke a hole in it and you provided more energy than you thought you would. So this, uh, these are ways where the differences in between enthalpy and internal energy show up in our everyday sort of lives. However, if I'm work, uh, uh, looking at a system with a gas, it turns out that any liquids or solids aren't going to contribute most uh, to this feature. Instead, what I'm really going to have to worry about is that the gas is going to expand. And I can deal with this by replacing PV with my ideal gas law, because PV is the same thing as NRT. Now here we're going to make a major assumption. We're going to assume that I'm working in a closed system. So I'm not doing any chemical reaction that's generating any new gas molecules. I'm not undergoing a phase change. I'm not boiling water. The number amount of gas I have is the amount of gas I have. In this case, N isn't changing and neither is R. So the only parameter that's changing in this case is temperature. And in this case, if I'm looking at heating a system, the enthalpy will be equivalent to the internal energy plus the amount of gas I have, the ideal gas constant, and the degree to which I've heated the system. Now, what we can do is use this to relate our isochoric and isobaric heat capacities, because we know that delta H is the same as NCP delta T. And we can do the same thing with NCV delta T for the, iso, uh, for the internal energy. And when I do this, I can relate the isobaric heat capacity to the isochoric heat capacity, where the isobaric heat capacity will always be larger than the isobaric or isochoric heat capacity by exactly a factor of the ideal gas law. So this gives us a way to look at changes in enthalpy, internal energy, by looking at our uh, heat capacities and making use of the changes in temperature. Next time, we're gonna look a little bit more specifically at how we can employ these changes in internal energy and enthalpy to make real measurements as we talk about calorimetry. Until then, take care.